So it's wonderful to see so many people in the library tonight. I am Holly Miller, the Assistant Dean for Scholarly Communication and Faculty Engagement. Unfortunately, Dr. Sohair Wastawi, Dean of Libraries, is not able to be with us this evening. She, call, she was called away at a meeting. She serves on the board of the Qatar National Library and they had, a, they had a meeting that she had to go to. So you have me instead. The idea for this event originated with Dean Wastawi, then the first director of the new Library of Alexandria. She was asked to deliver a speech in which she named the 10 books that had most influenced humanity and the creation of what is known as civilization. She and the president of the Library of Alexandria at the time did extensive research and to choose these 10 books that we'll speak of tonight. So these books were not chosen from a Western perspective, but a more global one. Compiling such a list is not as simple as one might imagine. While it's easy to draw up a long list of important books, it's much harder to distill that list to just 10. As you look around over there on some of the tables, you'll see books that we have pulled from our shelves. All these books have been on one top, top books list or another, and you may have already thought of a few titles for yourself in anticipating this event. And we actually received emails from some of you here tonight asking or hoping that your suggested titles and authors had made the list. <laughs> in fact, we intentionally did not share the titles until now. It's, so we just wanted to have some suspense and surprise you all. At the end of the presentations, I hope there'll be time for questions. So let's begin the countdown. The list is not in order of importance, rather the books are grouped based on the area of knowledge where they had their influence. And our first book is the Holy Bible. Over the course of human history, nothing has come close to the influence of religious texts. If you look at the sheer number of adherents to specific faiths, you will see that currently the Bible has 2.2 billion followers. This evening, Father Douglas Bailey will speak to us about the influence of the Bible over the centuries. <clears throat> Father Doug has been at the Catholic campus min mis excuse me, ministry since 1983 and is director of both Catholic and United Campus Ministries. He has also taught multiple Florida Tech philosophy, ethics, and religion courses. His PhD dissertation, entitled PTSD Severity Among Combat Veterans, Differences in Demographic Variables, could not be more relevant these days. He is also a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. Please welcome Father Doug. I'm glad we started early. I can put back in some of the things I took out. <laughs> my, my, my task is to tell you why the Bible is one of the most important books in the development of civilization. You know, last week I was speaking with a young high school student who'd been told by his parents that it wouldn't be a good idea for him to visit his extended family in Mexico City because of the violence and kidnappings there. And he asked why that situation existed, which is indeed a difficult question to answer. I said, there are always bad people, but when you combine bad people with government and police corruption, society itself is destroyed. And he then asked me if such a thing could happen here. I thought, ancient Rome. Ancient Rome, as you know, didn't want to become an empire. They backed into their domain. Whole countries submitted themselves to Roman rule. Some kings even willed their kingdoms to the people of Rome on their death. 
Why? Because Rome believed in the rule of law. And because their piety and their sense of honor made them trustworthy. And it was during, during the rule of Rome that the Jewish and Christian Bible became introduced to a wider society. At the time of Christ, one-seventh of the world was Jewish. And an equal number were God-fearers, meaning that they did not want to be circumcised and follow the kosher laws, but they admired the laws of Moses. This group became a prime source for Christian conversion. So during the time of Roman hegemony, the rule of law met the supreme lawgiver. The modern roots of our individual rights and freedoms are found in the Bible. The recognition of law, of the intrinsic value of each human being, didn't exist in ancient times. Among the Romans, law protected social institutions, such as the patriarchal family, but it did not safeguard the basic rights of the individual, such as personal security, freedom of conscience, of speech, of assembly, of association, and so forth. For them, the individual was of value only insofar as he was part of the political fabric and could be used for the aggrandizement of the state. According to Benjamin Constant, a great French political philosopher, it's wrong to believe that people enjoyed individual rights prior to Christianity. In 390, Bishop Ambrose, who was located in Milan, forced Emperor Theodosius to repent of his vindictive massacre of 7,000 people. The fact indicates that under the influence of the Bible, nobody not even the Roman emperor, would be above the law. For medieval thinkers, not even the king himself could violate certain rights of the subject because the idea of law was attached to the Bible-based concept of justice. The notion that law and liberty are inseparable is another legacy of the Bible. Accordingly, God's revealed will is regarded as a higher law and therefore placed above human law. And liberty is found under God's law because, as the Bible says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Barons compelled King John to sign the Magna Carta, and the charter underlies basic rights of the individual according to the biblical worldview. The absolutist monarch inherited from Roman law was thereby counteracted and transformed into a monarch explicitly under law. The biblical perspective worked there as a civilizing force and a stranger to despotism. As one may say, the Bible's message elevated the blood-drinking barbarians of the British Isles to decency. Biblical faith provided the people of England a status libertatis, state of liberty, which rested on the biblical presumption that God's law always works for the good of society. With their conversion to Christianity, the kings of England would no longer possess an arbitrary power over the life and property of individuals, changing the basic laws of the kingdom at pleasure. Rather, they were told about God's promise in the book of Isaiah to deal with civil authorities who enact unjust laws. In fact, the Bible contains many passages condemning the perversion of justice by rulers. In explaining why the citizens of England had much more freedom than their French counterparts, Charles Spurgeon, writing after the French Revolution, when Christianity had been outlawed, declared, there is no land beneath the sun where there's an open Bible and a preached gospel where a tyrant can hold his place. Let the Bible be open to be read by all men and no tyrant can rule in peace. 
England owes her freedom to the Bible, and France will never possess liberty lasting and well-established till she comes to reverence the gospel, which too long has been rejected. The Bible makes men think, and to make men think is always dangerous to a despot's power. The state is a necessary evil. It has to be subject to God's higher laws. After, the sin, after sin entered into the world, it became necessary to establish civil government in order to curb violence. However, the state was not envisaged in God's original plan as it places some people in authority over others. At the beginning of creation, Genesis tells us that a man and woman lived in close fellowship with God under his direct and sole authority. The understanding of sinful government as a result of our sinful condition justifies the doctrine of limitation of state powers. It inspired in both Britain and America the establishment of a constitutional order based on checks and balances between the branches of government. Since all human beings are born of sinful nature, the functions of state ought to be legally checked because no human being should be trusted with too much power. According to the Judeo-Christian worldview, human beings were created by God and as such have never acquired their basic rights from the state, nor are such basic rights the result of any work performed by them, but it flows directly from the nature of each human being who's conceived in the image of a loving God. According to Genesis, God created all human beings male and female, in his own image. We find here a very special meaning for the recognition of human dignity as a result of the relationship between God and his creatures. In declaring that we all stand on equal ground before God, the Bible gives the best moral foundation for social and political equality. From the Bible, the individual, male or female, is not only more important, but incomparably more important than the social body. Now, a fact in these days of moral relativism is the gradual abandonment of biblical faith and culture in the Western world. And as a result, the moral foundation for the rule of law have been seriously undermined. Westerners who believe that the abandonment of biblical principles will serve democracy ignore that such abandonment has already about brought about totalitarianism and mass murder in several Western countries, particularly in Germany and Russia. Any analysis of contemporary Western history would have to recognize that no effective legal protection against tyranny and corruption can in the long run be sustained without the higher standards of justice and morality brought into the texture of Western societies by the Bible. And before I finish, I would be remiss if I did not say one thing. The Bible is important because it connects you to God the Father God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's that connection that can change your life. Thank you. Thank you. Our second book is the Holy Quran, the central religious text for 1.6 million individuals. Dr. Muzaffar Sheikh will speak about the Holy Quran and how it influenced humanity. Dr. Sheikh is an Associate Vice President for International Partnerships, a distinguished professor, and the head of the Engineering Systems Department. Having come from industry, he has been at, with Florida Tech for over 28 years. Dr. Sheikh leads the Muslim community of Brevard and vicinity and he is his chief spokesperson. Dr. Sheikh. (laughs) 
Assalamu alaikum and greetings to all. Thank you, Father Bailey, for your uh, enlightening comments. First of all, <clears throat> I'm honored to be a part of this distin distinguished group of Florida Tech colleagues. Thank you very much. These types of knowledge forums are extremely beneficial this day and age in particular. They can remove lots of misunderstandings. Quran, the holy book of over 1.7 billion Muslims, continues to be memorized by heart. All 114 chapters of it, all 6,607 verses of it, by hundreds of thousands of Muslims as prophet's tradition. Indeed, a unique aspect of Quran. <clears throat> Quran is the unaltered, unalterable book of Almighty Allah. Radiocarbon analysis of the Quran, discovered recently at the University of Birmingham, UK, dates it back to within 10 to 15 years after the Prophet's death. And when matched to today's Quran, <clears throat> it, exact, it is exactly the same. Indeed, another unique aspect of Quran, unalterable. Quran, for us, is the last edition of the same book, the same message of oneness of Allah, given to Abraham in his pages or Sahifa, to David in Psalms, to Moses in Torah, to Jesus in the Bible, peace be upon them all. The message of monotheism for over half of the world's population today. Quran is the book of commandments and it is a factual principles laid down by the creator himself. Beyond the subject of faith and morals, which all religious books entail, Quran has specific statements, specific verses given 1,437 years ago that scientists and researchers are discovering to be true only today. Let us look at some examples. Cre creation of the universe. Today, many cosmologists agree that it is the three-step Big Bang theory that created the universe. The steps of smoke, then the fusion and separation. In chapter 41, verse 11, Quran says, first it was all smoke, then Almighty mentions in chapter 21, verse 30, heavens and earth all joined together. And finally, he says, we separated them. First creation of life. Today, we are finding that the life was first created in water. 1437 years ago, it was mentioned in Quran, in chapter, 20, in cha chapter 21, verse 30, we made every living thing from water. How about meeting of the two bodies of water? Only in the recent past, oceanographers have discovered that when two large bodies of water meet, they both maintain their own characteristics for miles and miles before resulting in combined characteristics. When Jacques Cousteau mentioned this phenomenon to his close friend Maurice Bocay of the French Academy of Medicine, he was not surprised and referred Jacques to chapter 55 verses 19 and 20 to chapter 25, verse 53. For example, the Mediterranean with higher salinity, when it, when it meets with Atlantic, it maintains its characteristics for miles and miles into Atlantic. Stages of growth of fetus in the mother's womb, the exact steps that scientists are finding only today they have been mentioned very precisely in chapter 22, verse 5, and also chapter 23, verse 14. Don't have the time to actually rehearse all of these verses, but I do have the copies of all these verses here. <laughs> uh, earth being round. Earth being round is a discovery of only recent centuries. Over 1400 years ago, it was revealed in Quran that earth was round again in chapter 39, 
verse 5. Examples after examples exist from archaeological findings to many other subjects in the Quran. Now who would know about all these facts that experts are only discovering now, 1437 years ago? Who would know? Not Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for he was a man. He didn't know how to read. He didn't know how to write. But only the Creator himself would know. Muslims in the past utilized facts of the Quran and discovered they invented many scientific principles. Many of you have heard of Averroes. He was Ibn Rushd of Cordoba, a great philosopher and a mathematician. He is best known in the West as an interpreter of Aristotle's philosophy. How about Razes? As he is known in the Western world, his real name was Muhammad Zakaria Razi. He was a great physician and a great chemist. He did extensive research in smallpox and chickenpox in those days, in those days. And Avicenna, he actually was Ali Hassan ibn Sina, another great Muslim physician. His writings, the book of healing, the canon of medicine, revolutionized the field of medicine as we see today, as we see today. Other inventions, like you must have heard, academicians, algorithms, algebra. Many of the students don't like some of these things, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, alchemy, alkali, alcohol. Alcohol, by the way, for antiseptic reasons, not for other reasons. It was all inventions of Muslims. Uh, but, but beyond research, beyond these academic examples, words and things that we use today in our daily life, like coffee, like candy, like cotton, like merge, uh, and, and almanac, they're all Arab-based names. The point is, when humanity works together, as all researchers did based on Quranic teachings in the past that we mentioned, bringing to the world platform all its combined expertise, the humanity wins and it flourishes. We pray for this revival. Finally, as you know, Islam continues to grow at a rapid pace everywhere, everywhere. Literally, everyone who accepts Islam credits this to Quran and its direct message and the lack of contradictions in the Quran. In particular, one single verse with most of the Muslims would know, should know, it says it all. That is the book about which there is no doubt. Therefore, I humbly urge you to pick up a copy of the Quran. I urge you to Google, Google Quran and Modern Science by Maurice Bukai. And also urge you to look at Zakir, Dr. Zakir Hussain about anything that you want to know about uh, Islam and Quran. Thank you for including Quran as an influence in this book. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. Our third and final book is The Vedas of Hinduism with about one billion followers. Dr. Bhaskar Tanali will speak about the impact of the Vedas. Dr. Tanali is a professor of mathematics and has been at Florida Tech since 2002. He formally studied Sanskrit, the language of the Vedas, and learned several Vedic chants. Dr. Tanali has a deep interest in the Indian philosophy and culture, and he has, been, he has given numerous talks, including a few at local churches discussing the universal outlook of the Vedas and the relevance of the Vedic message in modern times. Dr. Tanali. It gives me great pleasure to be here this evening to share some of my thoughts and understanding about Vedas. I'm very glad that uh, you've chosen Vedas to be part of the 10 most influential books. To start off, the language of the Vedas is Sanskrit. 
And every word in Sanskrit, uh, every syllable in Sanskrit has certain meaning that it conveys. So when you say Vedas, it has certain syllables. The root syllable is Vid. Vid to mean that to know. So Vedas contain information that uh, essentially is all that is worth knowing. To lead human life uh, in a meaningful and in a fulfilling manner. So that's the same word for education. Vidya is the Sanskrit word for education, which again has comes from the root word vid. So Vedas essentially are a collection of knowledge, informa not information, but it's knowledge about uh, how to lead human life on this, uh, on this earth so that it uh, makes a person live a meaningful life. Now Vedas, to begin with, are also not uh, is not one book. It is, a, it is actually four Vedas, compilation generally referred to as Vedas. The four Vedas are the Rig Veda, the Ejur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharvana Veda. These are the four Vedas, technically compiled into four different books. And uh, we refer to the source of these, uh, the author, so-called, is really there is no author, there's only a compiler for the Vedas. That is a person by the name Vyasa, and someone who does such an extraordinary amount of service to society by compiling all the meaningful uh, knowledge that is useful for the society to grow and thrive, is given a certain status of a sage in Indian uh, understanding. So we refer to him as a sage Veda Vyasa. So because he compiled the Vedas, we refer to him as Veda Vyasa. Now, Veda Vyasa is of the time period 3110 BC. That was the time when the great epic Mahabharata war, war happened. That's the great war that took place between two kings and uh, that was also the time when this divine personality known as Lord Krishna was part of this scene. And sage Veda Vyasa was a contemporary of Lord Krishna. Now after the war is over and then the things have returned to normal, the society needed to move on from then on. So at that time, whatever body of knowledge was available in the society, on various matters was simply compiled. There was too much of information and so what Sage Veda Vyasa did was to compile all of that into these four Vedic texts. So he was only a compiler and not an author. And the content of these Vedas referred to numerous topics. It contained, it, it was it's some sort of a discussions and discourses on matters like uh, philosophy, politics, and medicine, and astronomy, mathematics, astrology. You name a topic, almost all of those are touched on in these uh, Vedic texts. Now, it actually, these texts, were not required to be studied by everyone in the society. Obviously, this contained this body of knowledge, and there were scholars who devoted their life to learning this and understanding and propagating this to the rest of the society. And uh, this, this society, uh, so this Vedas provided, therefore, a moral fabric for the society to function. So it, it, uh, the, uh, the whole generation after generation, since through 3,000 to 100 BC is what we are talking about. That's 5,000 years ago. And since then, several generations of, uh, generations of people in India, and the India I'm referring to is not the modern India, that India then included Pakistan, some parts of Afghanistan, and then Burma, and Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan. So all of these countries were part of this, uh, this so-called ancient India. And the only thing that really held that notion that this is, this is what makes India was not because they were all speaking the same language. 
not because their food habits were same. There was really nothing that was so common about them that they could identify all as Indians. So what was it that was common to all of them that made them feel like they are Indians? It was their adherence, their allegiance to live their life by the dictums of Vedas. So it is the Vedas that make uh, the, uh, the li lifestyle that is based on the Vedas is what makes an Indian Indian. Now, so having said all this, several kingdoms that came later on, so such as, for example, the Maurya dynasty that was in the north at the time when the Alexander the Great invaded India. He had a great success all the way until he went to the border of India and that's where he lost his war. So that means there was a great weaponry, knowledge of weaponry already at that time. And a society was at its height of glory in those times. So the Maurya Empire that was around the time when Alexander invaded India is said to be one of the golden periods in Indian history. So metallurgy was part of this Vedic text. And uh, medicine, most of you are familiar probably with this alternative medicinal system known as Ayurveda. Some of, several people in the US actually use the medicines of Ayurveda, which is even pra in practice even today. So Ayurveda is part of this Vedic text as to how to prepare certain medicines. So it talks about uh, various uh, property as various constituents of human body and how to address the imbalances in the human body and so on. So there's a medicinal system that evolved based on the text, uh, Vedic text. Uh, so the Maurya dynasty and similarly the, the Vijayanagara empire which was in the 1400 AD I'm talking about, this is a more recent one. All of these various dynasties that were there in that, in that part of uh, earth the kings were very powerful. At the same time, they listened to a guru who gets the title because of their expertise in Vedas. So every kingdom had a guru who is supposed to be an expert in the Vedic message and Vedic knowledge. So a king who is very powerful actually takes advice from this guru as to what is the right thing to do. And the Vedic message is never confined to a particular land mass or geographical location or to any particular race as a, okay, Indians or Hindus, anything like that. Vedic thought as such is a universal thought in the sense it always speaks of uh, principles that are, that are applicable to the entire humanity. It, it always prefer, uh, prof, professed a peaceful approach to life, a, a holistic approach to life, not a one-sided one, and it, that's, that therefore it laid a social structure to the society. So it's, it, it talked about a human life where in the early stages one spends uh, in learning and then goes on to a householder life and then goes on after fulfilling the responsibilities as a householder, becomes a more or less a recluse and withdraws from the society to spend time deliberating on more esoteric subjects like philosophy, maybe spirituality, and then eventually leading to the more intense spiritual pursuits. So this was the moral fab, this was the social structure that was promoted. So the kings listened to these gurus and followed the advice based on these Vedas. And what exactly do, do these uh, the Vedas essentially proclaim? They, they place the highest value to knowledge because the very word Veda refers to that which is there to know. So what do they talk about? A Vedic message says, Asatoma Sadgamaya. May, and this is a prayer that's part of the Vedas. So may we all be led from the untruth to the truth. Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya. May, as all, may we all be led from darkness to light. Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya. Let us all be led from mortality to immortality. It speaks of entire humanity as one family. So it does not therefore limit it to a particular geographical or race or something as I already said. So it says Vasudhaika Kutumbakam, the entire universe or entire earth is of one family. And it sees the percept perception of Vedas is not just limited to humans, it includes the, all the other species that exist on earth. 
So it sees humans as part of nature or not as against nature. So nature is not something that is to be conquered, but is to be lived with harmony and therefore create peace and harmony amongst us. So with that kind of a universal approach and a desire to promote peace and harmony, it's laced on very general moral and spiritual moral principles based on which all the other structures have evolved, like political science and including mathematics, I must say, because I am a mathematics professor, so I must say that <laughs> zero, the concept of zero, is a contribution from Indian mathematicians, as you all know. So that is actually referred to in the Vedas. The concept of shunya, meaning zero, is referred to in the Vedas. Algebra has come as an offshoot of Vedas. So many of these modern sciences, all the chemistry and metallurgy and all of these are offshoots of this text. How have they influenced? They kept a large part of that society in order for several thousands of years. There was no conflict. People existed in peace and they grew. Things changed over time. Of course, 5,000 is a long time. Years is a long time to uh, pass. So there were rise and fall in this Vedic culture. Uh, and there are several misunderstandings because that's a, such a long time. People do think it is a, an author, there is an author and things like that. But as I said, this is only a compiler. And it stands there and it is for anybody to uh, understand, read. And now there are several translations available. It's for anybody to read and understand and relate that to our lives, no, no matter which part of the world we are and what uh, uh, country or nationality we come from. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tonali. The books that follow are selected from philosophy and science. In fact, science was known as natural philosophy in the past. Mindful of the idea that we are measuring influence, the author of our fourth book dominated both antiquity and much of the Middle Ages, influencing Muslim and Western philosophers. His views on physical science profoundly shaped medieval scholarship. We still owe to him the articulation of the precepts of logic, which we use in science and philosophy to this day. As you may have already guessed, the fourth book, authored by Aristotle, is the Organon. Dr. Andrew Aberdeen will speak to us about the impact of Aristotle's work. Dr. Aberdeen is a professor of philosophy in the School of Arts and Communication at Florida Tech, where he has taught since 2003. He is also this year's president of the Florida Philosophical Association. He's particularly interested in the role of logic in science, technology, and mathematics. Welcome, Dr. Aberdeen. Thank you very much, and, uh, and thank you to Dean Rastawi and the library for their invitation to say a few words about Aristotle this evening. Uh, many of you may, uh, may have seen uh, Raphael's School of Athens. Uh, it's one of the most famous paintings uh, of the, the Renaissance. It's certainly one of the most famous paintings of philosophers. It depicts a, a whole number of, of philosophers drawn from, uh, from the ancient world. Uh, but the two figures at the centre are the two most famous of Greek philosophers, uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, they're depicted in conversation, which is natural enough because Aristotle was Plato's student. Um, but they're also depicted with characteristic gestures. Uh, Plato is shown um, pointing his, his, his right hand upwards, uh, indicating uh, the transcendent uh, in which he believed uh, the true reality lay. But Aristotle, who's shown as a younger man, is standing next to him. He's holding his right hand spread outwards with the fingers pointing outwards. Uh, he's indicating uh, the world around him uh, and all the multitudinous things that make up that world. Uh, uh, this is how Aristotle is, is standardly understood as differing from Plato, whereas Plato uh, uh, sees our world as just a, a pale shadow of true reality. Aristotle focuses on, on the reality of our world itself. Uh, and this is why he's often seen as the, uh, as, as the originator of modern natural science. Uh, for Aristotle, the true reality is imminent within the world. 
Uh, indeed, Aristotle spent 20 years uh, as both pupil and colleague of Plato, uh, so he knew Plato's uh, work intimately. Uh, but after uh, Plato died, he left Athens, and he spent four years uh, out in the Greek islands, uh, mostly studying marine biology, as we would now call it. I mean, he was looking at uh, octopi and various things. In, I mean, it sounds quite an idyllic life in a way, um, but studying um, creatures in, the, uh, in the, the shallow waters around Greek islands. Um, in many ways, though, I mean, that, that seems like a break from his philosophical career. But in some respects, this is the foundation of his mature philosophical perspective. Uh, this focus on, particularly on form. Um, Plato, of course, had an idea of form, but he saw that his, his idea of form was as transcendent. Aristotle's idea of form was as something to be found in individual specific creatures. Now, he has... Whereas Plato always brings a mathematical approach to things, Aristotle's approach in some respects is a biological approach. He wants to anatomize everything. Uh, ultimately, that's what lies behind uh, his great work in, in logic. Of course, Aristotle, um, well, he had the advantage of, of, of being right at the beginning of Western science, and he was the uh, innovator in a huge diversity of different areas of scientific inquiry, uh, ranging from meteorology, meteorology to uh, literary criticism, uh, he can claim to be the, pretty much the, to have written the book in, in each case. Um, but in each of those fields, he employs the same strategy. He looks for shared forms that underpin uh, the multitude of different phenomena, and he also employs the same toolkit uh, to look for those shared forms. That toolkit was the organon. Literally, the word organon means instrument, uh, that is, the, the instrument of logic, uh, whereby philosophical and scientific inquiry uh, is conducted. Uh, as with, uh, with the religious texts we've just been hearing about, uh, or at least as with the, the, the Bible and, and, and the Vedas, the, uh, the choice of title uh, wasn't Aristotle's, uh, and indeed the selection of works that get to be included within the organon uh, wasn't Aristotle's. He produced these works. It's not even clear that he intended them for publication. Um, they probably were his lecture notes. Uh, he may have intended some other works for publication, which have sadly now been lost, but in some respects, though, we, we kept the best bits. Um, the organon consists of six of Aristotle's works on logic, uh, which are known, the titles that they've come down to us with are the categories on interpretation, the prior analytics, the posterior analytics, the topics, and on sophistical refutations, uh, in, and they're assembled, uh, as I guess we ought to expect, uh, in logical order. Uh, the categories <laughs> analyzes individual terms, such as dog or runs, on interpretation shows how those terms may be assembled into sentences, such as some dog runs, and the prior analytics shows how those sentences can make up arguments, such as some dog runs, nothing that runs sits, so some dog does not sit. Uh, the last three of the six discuss particular types of argument. Uh, the posterior analytics addresses scientific arguments, the topics addresses dialectical or philosophical arguments, and uh, the last work on sophistical refutations looks at fallacious arguments. The, the brilliant insight that Aristotle had into logic was yet another application of his idea of form. And he, what he, he realized was that arguments with entirely different subject matter could still share a common form, and it's this form which determines whether the argument's any good. I mean, here are a couple of examples actually taken from my logic midterm of last month. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just to indicate the continuing currency of Aristotle's work. So, here's one argument. Uh, some lawyers play golf. Only law school graduates are lawyers, so at least one golfer has graduated law school. Uh, and here's another one. Uh, only social scientists are political scientists. Many political scientists favor campaign finance reform. Accordingly, many persons who favor campaign finance reform are social scientists. Um, they don't, at first glance, seem to have much in common. I mean, the first one's certainly funnier. Um, but, uh, but on closer analysis, uh, as Aristotle would show, and as I'm obviously not going to show, but on closer analysis, they share a common form. This isn't just a way of classifying arguments, though. It's how Aristotle and pretty much every logician since 
distinguishes good arguments from bad arguments. These two arguments are both valid arguments. That's to say that their conclusions uh, must be true if their premises are. Whether their premises are true, that's, that's not a matter for logicians. That's uh, everybody else's problem. But whether the, <laughs> if the premises are true, the conclusion has to follow. That's what logic can tell you about these arguments. Um, and what that means uh, for an argument to be valid is that there are literally no arguments of this form which have true premises and false conclusions. So validity is a property not of the individual arguments, not of talk about golfers and social scientists. That validity is a property of the underlying form of the argument. Um, that's the, the really clever idea uh, which, which certainly uh, has influenced pretty much everything done since in logic. Uh, in, in closing, I can do no better than to quote uh, Father Joseph Bohensky, the doyen of historians of logic, who said of Aristotle's works that it is no exaggeration to say that nothing comparable has been seen in the whole history of formal logic. Not only is Aristotle's logic, according to all our information, a completely new creation, but it has been brought, even by him, to a high degree of completeness. It's no wonder that his works should have continued to fascinate nearly all logicians for more than 2,000 years, and that the whole history of logic has developed along lines traced out in advance by Aristotle's thought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aberdeen. The fifth book will not be a surprise to our students and faculty. While little is known about the author's life, he laid the foundation of axiomatic mathematics, which is the basis of much of geometry. This is the single most taught scientific text, largely unchanged for over 2,200 years. It is important to mention that the author wrote this book while a scholar at a library, the original library of Alexandria, in fact. The fifth book is Euclid's Elements, and Dr. Semen Kirksel will share her thoughts on its impact in her field of mathematics. Dr. Kirksel received her PhD in applied mathematics from Florida Tech. She has taught both undergraduate and graduate math courses since 1985. She served as the head of the Department of Mathematical Sciences and is now the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Please welcome Dr. Kirksel. Thank you. Those of you, I'm sure everybody in the room has taken high school geometry and heard about Euclid and it, his most famous book, The Elements. In fact, entire high school geometry is based on the Euclid's elements. And um, that's not, however, it's, the, it's not the only reason that it is the most influential textbook in the human history. And also it is known as the most widely circulated and printed book after the Bible. So I will probably call it then the Bible of Mathematics <laughs> if, if Father allows me to do that. <laughs> okay, so as, as Dr. Miller said, it, it was written about 2,300 years ago. And uh, uh, it's, it consists of 13 books. And the, the first five, in fact, six books lay out the entire theory of plane geometry about the points, straight lines, parallel lines, and uh, triangles, circles, um, tangents, angles, so anything that falls into that uh, ca category. And the books from seven to nine, so seven, eight, and nine, they deal uh, with theory of numbers, mainly ratios and pro uh, proportions and prime numbers. And the book 10, the 10th book, is on in, uh, incommensurables, which means that the numbers who cannot be written as the ratios of integers. So in modern life, you know, the modern mathematics, so the, 
you have heard, I'm sure, the irrational numbers like square root of 2 or pi. So those are in this category. And then the last three books are about solid geometry, spheres and um, um, uh, cylinders and uh, other solids. So he followed certain style Euclid when he wrote these 13 books. First of all, it was very dry, no motivations. Well, I shouldn't call dry as a mathematician because I believe that the word dry and boring doesn't exist in the vocabulary of math. So math is exciting and fun. But if you read it, so I, I guess the non-mathematicians, so they will call it. So no motivations, no examples, no explanations. So all books consisted um, definitions, axioms and postulates, and theorems. So definitions mainly just, you know, they're the names of ideas. And that doesn't mean that something has a name, is defined, it exists. So we have to show it does exist. Axioms and postulates are about the same. They're, they're accepted with no proof, but the axioms are more general than the postulates. Postulates usually are for some specific subject. And the theorems, obviously, they have the hypothesis, assumptions, and based on those, using definitions, axioms, and postulates, you prove something either is right or not or exists or doesn't. So this was the structure and style of all those 13 books. There are some, uh, some very famous you know, postulates and definitions that we all have heard. So some of those maybe, let me see if I can find somewhere because, ah, I know why I cannot. <laughs> I forgot, I, long time ago, I passed the age, age of 40, so I need my reading glasses. <laughs> okay, so he defines one of the definitions, very simple. He defines a point is that which has no part. So really simple definition. A line is breathless length. So a straight line. Straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. So one of the most known, well-known uh, postulates is known as the parallel line postulates for parallel lines or maybe unparallel, depending on how you will interpret that. So it says, if a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles. So if you have two, two lines like this, and then the third one cutting those, making the interior angles less than right angles, 90 degrees, then says those two lines, if produced indefinitely, so if you can extend them as long as you can possible, meet on that side on which are the angles less than to the right angles. So, which means that, so these lines eventually, if you extend them far enough, long enough, they will meet, they will intersect, so they're not parallel. So, okay, so another proposition, uh, which is a, okay, so the theorems, under the category of theorems, he had some propositions which are mini, smaller theorems, but need to be proved and then the more complicated involved ones were the, the actual theorems. So the, one of the most important, I mean the most uh, known ones that you may have heard says circles are two one another as the squares on the diameters. So which means that basically translating to the modern, modern language is that the circles are proportional, two circles are proportional to the squares of their diameters. Well, number pi was not known then, and the area of a circle was not really known then. The, as a formula that we know pi r square, 
R being the radius of the circle, this proposition actually really is nothing but it, it gives us the, the proportion of the areas of two circles without the proportionality constant pi, basically. So the first area, let's say we have two circles, C1, C2, C1 over C2 is equal to R1 square over R2 square, R1 and R2 being the radii of the circles respectively. So we can go on and on. Well, you can maybe not, uh, you notice, you have noticed that I missed teaching math because with my, <laughs> with my new administrative position. So I, in 28 years, this is the first time that I took a break from teaching, from, teaching, from classroom, so I miss my students. <laughs> okay, well, so why is the elements so influential and is known one of the, you know, the most influential textbook and the most widely uh, circulated book after the Bible. Well, it, besides the fact that it laid down the entire the theory of geometry, Euclidean geometry, by the way, because later on we have, you know, we came up, mathematicians came up with the non-Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry and number theory, he, Euclid, showed what human beings are capable of achieving using logical, systematic steps in showing something. So he was actually a teacher of logic too, science of logic. So he's, he followed extremely systematic, logical steps without using any of the mathematical symbols, notations that we are familiar now in modern life, without using those, any of those, he proved all his theorems uh, in a very logical and systematical way. So that was very, very important to, to the development of the mathematical and scientific fields that after Euclid. Very, even though he was so, he, he became uh, perhaps the most influential mathematician in human history, very little known uh, about him. So the one thing for certain that is known is that he taught mathematics in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, before, after Plato, but before Archimedes of Syracuse. In fact, uh, many people believe that uh, he was uh, he was a student in Plato's academy, so he learned a lot there in that academy. And also, uh, it is believed that he arrived Alexandria ten years after Alexander the, Alexander the Great founded the city. So he was dead by then. And, um, but, uh, and the city was ruled by King Ptolemy. And, uh, uh, yes, Ptolemy. And King Ptolemy started a, a research institute, what was called then the museum. And the museum was established as the center for learning and teaching. And a lot of... Uh, uh, professionals, mathematicians and scientists had taught in, in the museum. And uh, so King Ptolemy actually attended some of the geometry courses that was, were taught by Euclid at the time. By the way, Euclid didn't use the word geometry in his work. The reason for that, at the time, the word geometry meant earth measurement. And what Euclid did was way more than measuring earth, so he didn't use the word geometry when he did his work. But when, when the King Ptolemy attended his, his classes, so I want to quote two things here, two quotes I want to mention. He one day, King, asked Euclid if there was a short way to learn geometry, shortcut. 
Yes. And the Euclid's answer was, there is no royal road to geometry, so you have to do the real world. <laughs> and the second one, I like actually more, and I believe it is still very valid. Those of us who have taught, who have been teaching, will identify with that very well. One of, you, uh, one of Euclid's students asked what he will do, get, earn, with all this information. Is, does that sound familiar? <laughs> yes. So we all know, especially in math. So what do I do with, with this theorem or with this equation? Well, Euclid basically said, just you have to learn this for the sake of math and the knowledge. So, well, sometimes we do say that to our students, but these days students don't take it so well, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> we really have to explain them why they have to learn. And then, um, Abraham Lincoln, he one time said that learning, studying Euclid's elements gave him power because he learned how to think logically from the elements. So this is why and why the elements is so important and it has survived even though all this copy uh, that we have right now dates back to 888 AD and it is in Oxford's library. So till then we didn't really have the copies and the handwritten manuscripts survived more than 1,500 years, and the book elements still remains to be the, the most influential math book, or even the textbook, I should say, not just the math. Thank you very much. Dr. Kirksel. The next choice was much harder. The contributions of Ibn al-Haytham in establishing the scientific method at the end of the 10th century or the works of al-Khwarizmi in mathematics or Ibn Sina in medicine or Ibn Khaldun in sociology and history or those of Ibn al-Shatir in astronomy. But these great figures, pioneers and visionaries, due to certain accidents of history, did not have the influence they deserved. Moving chronologically to the birth of the scientific revolution, which came after the Renaissance, Galileo's Dialogue of the Two World Systems has been selected as the sixth book. And I will be presenting Dr. Wastawi's justification of this choice. Now it is true that Copernicus, not Galileo, who did the revolutionary work of proposing the heliocentric system of the cosmos, one where the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. So momentous was, this deci was that decision to reject the geocentric model for a heliocentric one, and so vehemently did the church oppose it that we can use it as a marker for the end of the dark ages and the start of rationality. That notion that we can use our brain to evaluate the evidence and base our conclusions on our observations, on our logical deductions, is truly crucial for freedom of expression and for eliminating, liberating the human mind from the tyranny of dogma. It was essential for the enlightenment and the march towards scientific and technical progress. So why Galileo and not Copernicus? Partly because few people actually have read the works of Copernicus. Galileo chose to frame his arguments in the form of a trilogue or a play between three characters in which the merits of the various cosmologies were questioned and discussed. He wrote in Italian, already made famous by Dante, who was the first to break with the medieval tradition of writing in Latin and wrote the Divine Comedy in Italian. Galileo's trial is a touchstone of the confirmation of the confrontation between dogma and the freedom of expression. 
And even though he was forced to recant, the moral victory was his, and the heliocentric system would prove unstoppable. All right. <laughs> The seventh book is difficult to read, heavily mathematical and originally in Latin. This book marks a dividing line in history. Before it, most people believed that there were no laws governing the universe, or if there were such laws, they were beyond the understanding of humans. After this book, people began to believe that there were laws governing the universe and that we, what we do not understand today we can study and thus understand in the future. What a momentous world, what a momentous shift in the worldview. With that clue, you may already realize our next and seventh book is Newton's Principia Mathematica, which is Latin for mathematical principles of natural philosophy. It is often just simply called Principia. Dr. Uger Abdullah will speak about Newton's impact on science and technology. Dr. Abdullah joined the Mathematical Sciences Department in 2004 and now serves as its department head. One thing that makes us especially proud is that our archives exhibition room over there, we have a handwritten formula by Dr. Abdullah that the American Institute of Mathematical Sciences considers one of the 11 most significant advances in mathematics. Please welcome Dr. Abdul. Well, uh, th thank you very much for a very kind introduction. First, first uh, let me correct that one of the 11 is significant in one particular year, not for all the time, so <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, it is my great pleasure to present Masterpiece, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy by Sir Isaac Newton, or Principia, or Principia as it is uh, briefly called. Now, this, uh, this book uh, is considered, and I agree with that, is transition point in the history of humanity, without any doubt. So it, it's basically, it, is, uh, it revolutionized whole science and created, basically gave the program of the whole development of natural sciences. Now, I actually was very pleased when you asked me, and believe it or not, I actually decided to read the book, because of course, <laughs> and, and I did. So, and most difficult part, of course, was in English, of course, so mathematics was easy, basically, kind of, which we know and we, we teach and study, but still I tried to find the answer myself that what is really why this, this book is really is the best of all the time. And surprisingly, the answer was already in the first sentence in the preface, as I discovered. Let me, I will, usually I, when I give my lectures, I don't use notes, so believe me. But when I, due to my respect to Newton, I want to read the course exactly how he wrote. So he starts as uh, following, since the ancients, as we are told by Papus, he means Papus of Alexandria, esteemed the science of mechanics of greatest importance in the interpretations of natural things. And the moderns, and he means, of course, Galileo and uh, <clears throat> all the great uh, scientists of that age, and the moderns, rejecting substantial forms and occult qualities, have endeavored to subject the phenomenon of nature to the laws of mathematics, I have in this treatise cultivated mathematics as far as it relates to philosophy. So here is the main principle, main thing, revolutionary thing what Newton did. So basically what all these ancients and modern, what they did, they looked to, the main science is called let's say mechanics, they looked to mechanics and they tried to cultivate mechanics the garden was mechanics, and they tried to cultivate and plant mathematics in order to explain. Newton did a different thing, completely opposite. He cultivated mathematics and planted mechanics over there. And that was a revolutionary step. Newton was a mathematician. 
he was perhaps the best mathematician of all times. I personally agree with that. And he changed not only science, he changed also mathematics. So now, now he's, this is his first sentence, that means he is already declaring that my goal here, despite all these ancients, is to cultivate. His garden is mathematics. And mathematics, you look to this age when Newton lived, is, is Dr. Coxell presented, is basically, when you said mathematics, the number one thing was a geometry, because a geometry was a well-established branch of mathematics and which perfection, by the way, Newton was a perfectionist, it was perfect axiomatic science. I mean, obviously, in physics and every other branch, even in mathematics, something was far from due to genius of Euclid. That means, what is axiomatic science? You introduce concepts, as Dr. Coxell explained, and then based on these concepts, you declare axioms, which is faith, basically, and based on the axioms, you prove the phenomena, and, and that's it. So this is, everything is perfect. Whatever is rejected by axioms or cannot be proven is out, okay? So mechanics was far from, from this rigorousity. But Newton thought, he said, why? Because the geometry is, he looked to mathematics, to geometry basically, and he saw mechanics. He said, why? Because what is, what is uh, geometry? Concepts are points, straight line, although they are idealized, or circles, but we see this all the time. This is a part of the mechanics. So he saw mechanics in geometry. So I continue quote. The ancients considered mechanics in twofold respect. As rational, which proceed accurately by demonstration, and practical. To practical mechanics, all the manual arts belong, from which mechanics took its name. But as artificers, well, the word artificer I will translate as engineers, okay? But as artificers do not work with perfect accuracy, it comes to pass that mechanics is so distinguished from geometry that what is perfectly accurate is called geometrical. What is less so is mechanical. And here is his famous sentence. He said, however, the errors are not in the art, but in artifices. So basically, Newton says that the fact that we can't measure things accurately doesn't mean that the art of mechanics is erroneous or inaccurate. It is just our inability to measure. And, and then he goes further. He basically prepares in prepares readers that he is going to create axiomatic mechanics. By the way, laws of uh, what we call Newton's law, he calls them axioms. He said axioms of mechanics and laws. So now I, <clears throat> and then basically he says, to describe right lines and circles, so he gives a one very good example, I explained it. He says that, well, geometry starts from right lines and circles. But to describe right lines and circles are problems, but not geometrical problems. The solutions of these problems are required from mechanics. The glory of geometry is that from those few principles brought from without, it is able to produce so many things. Then he concludes that therefore geometry is founded on mechanical practice and is nothing but the part of the universal mechanics. So he declares now geometry is a part of universal mechanics. And, and, and Basically, after that, he explains the axiomatic power of geometry, and he declares his program. This is a program of modern science, starting from Newton. I would say it survived until Einstein, but this is a different topic. So, <laughs> Newton's program is this. I offer, I offer this work as mathematical principles of philosophy. For the whole burden of philosophy seems to consist in this from the phenomenon of motions to investigate the forces of nature, and then from these forces to demonstrate the other phenomena. And then he prepares, he says that, but although he is going to give axiomatic mechanics, he sees geometry as mechanics, or mechanics in the field of mathematics, but he says that obviously this geometry is not going just immediately applied. You need to, of course, the structure is there, but you have to find the right notions. 
And he said that one famous quote also here is that you don't have to be you don't have to be abstract in order to be perfect. So he basically prepares that abstract geometry theory in mechanics, this will not be abstract. And then he gives another explanation that directly geometrical axioms and notions, of course they will not be applicable. Why? Because Newton, Newton said, I am interested in moving bodies. So when you have a moving bodies, usually their magnitude is attached to geometry, but their motion attached to mechanics. So existing geometry will not be enough because he's interested in the motion. So that's why geometry by Newton was developed to what we call it calculus, which is mathematics of change. Okay? And, and so interestingly enough, when he, in his book, a lot of proofs, I mean the beautiful proofs, but nothing calculus tools even close to calculus tools. Now we have all these results are proven by calculus tools, but by that time he proved all this by geometry, or one can call infinitesimal calculus, based he founding on the limits of ratios of small quantities. So, but maybe also that was an established, but interesting light checks that in fact his main publication in calculus came somewhere 10 years after this publication of that. So, but he's from the preface, and that was actually one of the biggest points, conflicting points and contradiction points in the history because Leibniz, you know, another great German mathematician who is actually published some works of the calculus even before Newton. But then Newton said that, I already said about this in my Principia, so that was in my book, but Nothing is here written in, in this world, I, I can confess that, but in, indeed, when you read the preface and his program, he basically talks clearly about the calculus tools. So there is no, no doubt in my mind that this, uh, this is another topic for another discussion, this discovery of calculus was made independently by Newton and, and Leibniz. So now, he now read, everything is ready, and then he basically starts his, so first, just like in geometry, he defines the concepts. Concepts, like instead of straight lines, point, now concepts are mass, momentum, force of inertia, impressed force, centripetal force, acceleration, weight. So these are everything, you know, qu uh, quantities which you exactly need, and after that, he calls this axioms of motion, and he brings his this ax axioms or laws of motion. So he calls them axioms. That means three famous laws. You all know this. Now, these high school students even know we, we started this. Now, <clears throat> one thing I would like to bring that is basically one of the most important things what Newton did. So that was a unique moment, momentum in the history. He, development of mathematics and science was highly disproportional in the time of Newton. Mathematics due to Euclid and this geometry went so far ahead and science or mechanics was struggling somewhere on the back. So Newton removed this disproportion, disproportion, unfair disproportion between. He basically brought, conveyed the beauty and abstract power of mathematics to mechanics and developed that. And since then, mathematics basically shared the abstract beauty which it had with natural sciences, starting from the physics. And that's why this is a decisive moment in the history. And, and even if you look to, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, the influence of this masterpiece is even goes beyond uh, just science and, and mathematics. I think that when I read this Principia recently, when I, when I read it, actually I managed to finish it right today, so, <laughs> One, one important thing I see that when, when you read, I, what comes to your mind, it is just one word. It is beautiful. It is beautiful without any do doubt. And, but there is, I found that something here more than just beauty, beauty which you see in geometry, for example. So that's why I thought actually about that. What is actually the beauty? The concept of beauty is one of the most controversial concepts. And there are two definitions 
of beauty, which basically contradict with each other. Mathematical beauty, what beauty in science and art, I will call it Kantian notion of the beauty. As Kant defines, I will use my uh, German, taking advantage of that. Kant's definition of the beauty is the following. He said that Schön ist was ohne Begriff allgemein gefällt. English translation, the beautiful is that which apart from a concept pleases universally. That is what in mathematics, beauty of abstract mathematics is lies on that. We are mathematicians, find the mathematics beautiful, not because it helps us to prove the theorems, because we are pleased with that, we're enjoying that. But Newton, actually, in the Principia, you have here also other beauties. Another definition, I will give another definition of the beauty, against Kantian, contradictory to Kantian definition, is a materialistic definition of the beauty. I would give this ref uh, probably reference to Russian uh, philosopher Chernyshevsky and use taken advantage of my Russian knowledge. Is basically, in his famous piece called Aesthetic Relation of Art to Reality, he said, Прекрасное – это жизнь. Translation, beauty is life. To man, a beautiful being is that being in which he sees life as he understands it. So that's a contradictory. I think in Newton's Principia, I see both. He basically conveyed abstract beauty of mathematics to this practical beauty, which is connected to real life. So he generously shared the beauty of mathematics with physics and other natural sciences. And I would say in conclusion that in my opinion, what Newton did, he arranged the perfect marriage between mathematics and physics. And ladies and gentlemen, it's the greatest honor to be descendant of this marriage, or what we call it, to be a scientist. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. The theory of evolution by natural selection remains the overarching theory of biology. It changed perceptions of ourselves and the living organisms with which we share the world. Therefore, our eighth book is The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Dr. Ralph Turningen will speak to us about the impact of this book. Dr. Turningen is a professor of biological sciences and the chair of, marine bio and the, chair of the marine biology program. He teaches a wide range of biology courses, including comparative or evolutionary vertebrate anatomy. Dr. Turningen. Thank you. I will use my five minutes to give you Darwin. <laughs> it truly, he it truly is a famous person until today. Although there are silent contradictions to his theory, one of my students yesterday spoke out about his contradiction, his, his disbelief of the theory of evolution. Well, I teach comparative anatomy. Comparative anatomy is explaining to my students how our arms and our legs evolved. Where did they, where did they come from? And I do respect our first three speakers about the other type of explanation. <laughs> because Darwin, although he grew up in, the, in, in those times where you have to be silent about your scientific thoughts, be, or you will be persecuted. And so Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. And here he is growing as a young man at the age of 26 when he first uh, courageously got out of England and went to discover the world. So he went as one of the youngest member of the HMS Beagle. It was a scientific expedition to the South Americas. And this lasted for about four years. The last year of that, 
really awaken him. And so they went, so, so here's Darwin as a young person and as, as, as an aged man when he was full of controversy. So he was educated in Cambridge. He was ordered by his parents to become a medical doctor. And that was because during those times, it was the easy science. You didn't have to think about reasons. You just have to treat, identify what a disease is, and come up with a treatment. But he flanked. He was not interested in medicine, and so he wanted to be a natural scientist. So he joined the HMS Beagle. He went out, and along with the expedition, which was a geological mission, he collected organisms. He just went there and observed and enjoyed his, the view of the Galapagos Islands, which would, would, would be the start of his controversial thought process. So he noticed that there are so many islands in the Galapagos. And as he collected all of these organisms, he noticed that there were so many different kinds of these organisms. And, that, and those differences were actually associated with which island they grew up in. And so why? Okay, so he, 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 he went back to England. And after the voyage, which ended up in, in, in 1834, he started documenting his experience. So he, he had several manuscripts, but they were all about descriptions. Remember that his discovery of these variations in how organisms actually live their lives started in the 1830s. But he published his book two Two, two decades later. So he wrote all descriptives. It's just like when you begin to become a scientist, all you want to do is describe what, to address the question what. And so he was actually very busy because later on, he published in 1859 the origin of the species. His own theory as to why those organisms had island-specific characteristics with them, okay? And so he came up with, you know, he came up with some explanation, some perhaps, but he kept it quietly for 20, 20 odd years, simply because of the atmosphere where he was actually becoming to develop his theory. And so there are several reasons as to why he delayed the publication of the, of, of the origin of the species, and I'm going to give you some, um, but, the idea behind his explanation as to why these organisms were so different is simply because there is not enough resources for every single individual to live by. So there were always a fight for existence, competition for food, competition for space abode, competition for something to eat or to even escape from being eaten, and that is predation. And of course, there is not enough room for every single individual that would be born. And so he, he said, why? So it is conceivable then that the reasons why those individuals lived in those different islands and they looked differently is that they survived those competitions and so they must have come up with ammunition we call anatomy in order to avoid death. And so they were the survivors. So his concept of descent with modification was rooted from those observations in that those ammunitions that portray the winning of those individuals who had it had actually evolved to adapt to the existing conditions. And that was the controversy at his time. Evolved? What is evolution? Okay, so he was a student at that time when change was actually not a word to actually even describe things. Everything settled and that was it. There was no change at all. Yet in his, in his theory, 
evolution is modification with descent. As people, as organisms evolved through time, along with them were changes in their form and function. And those changes were consistent with what the demands of the existing environment was putting onto them. And so it was sometimes his theory were coined as survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest. So you must be fit in order to survive and survive especially this competition for limited resources in this case. So his theory was based on the, the fact or the notion that species have or organisms have descended from pre-existing conditions and the descendants are going to have their form and function consistent with the experiences that they were going to live by in these cases. So, so evolution in Darwin's term was change through time. And that was controversial at that point. What are his foundations for this theory? Well, he said, well, the fact is populations overgrow themselves. They reproduce. They grow so many numbers of the same kind. And remember that there is not enough resource for every single individual that was born. And that was the reason why some of them died. And those that survived had the right tools with them. And he, he went ahead and said that those right tools were going to be passed on from generations to generation. And so over time, those generations then, or extant representatives of the generations, are going to begin to be different, to be different, to be different from each other in this case. And now in modern times, the concept of the genes was so young at those points, but at this time, there actually are very good support for the fact that every single individual has an arsenal of different kinds of genes that the environment will just be picking on those that would fit. And that's why there is a basis for his theory that there is a possibility that those individuals will actually change through time. And of course, another criteria, criterion for his philosophy to actually be reasonable is that there has to be a struggle to survive. And that struggle to survive is actually inherent in the fact that there is not enough resource for every single person, for every single indiv individual. And then, of course, there is differential reproduction in which one of the competitive advantages of populations is they will outcompete each other by the number of offsprings they're going to produce. The more, the better in those cases. That it, at least the, the perpetuation of the species only requires one individual to remain alive for the next, next of kin to actually be produced in this case. So, but Darwin, in fact, did not, and he admitted this himself before he died, he did not invent the concept of evolution. It, and during those times, there was a, 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 a professor named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, a French student, in, a professor in Cambridge, who actually coined this change through time. It was not called evolution then. It was called transformers, transformist movement. But Lamarck, Lamarck's idea was very different from that of Darwin's. And it is proven to these days that Lamarck's concept of evolution is actually very different from descent with, uh, with modification as Darwin had promoted, simply because Lamarck was describing what has happened to an individual <clears throat> from birth till death. Very different from Darwin's concept. Remember that Darwin, these good traits must be passed on from generations to generations. Lamarck did not think of that. Lamarck, to, to, to Lamarck's credit, though, his contribution is now well known in exercise physiology, in that if you work out, your muscles and your bones are going to grow bigger. 
in Lamarck's idea, that was evolution that was changed through evolution. It is not enough because, in fact, I'm using Arnold in here as, the, as an example, a famous weightlifting Olympian, and he was not well built when he was born. And so he was 12 years old in this fir first picture in here, and he started to work out. And then when he became, he passed teenage years, he actually was more bulky. In Lamarck's idea, his next of kin, his sons, will also be bulky. And you know that that is not true. You know, in one of, in one of his, in not, not even one of his children was actually as bulky as him. So that in itself is, is one good illustration that Darwin's philosophy of natural selection is very different from what had happened during his time in this case. Now, why delay the origin of species publication for 20 years? Darwin was very busy. He didn't really care about com competition in science. So he thought that he could keep this for quite a while until this guy, Wallace, Albert, Alfred Wallace, came up with this, the same exact idea, the same exact hypothesis as Darwin's, although they were apart. Wallace was a very poor naturalist. He actually went out to Southeast Asia, the opposite part of the world, to collect organisms and sell them to museums for his livelihood. Whereas Darwin was born rich, he was in this more exclusive kind of a voyage, and he went to South America and the Galapagos. So Darwin sat on this manuscript for two, two decades until he was threatened by the fact that Wallace was going to publish his manuscript on exactly the same theory of natural selection, evolution by modification with descent. And so in 1859, afraid that he will lose his fame, he went out and, and Darwin published eight, the, uh, the, the book first and Wallace just went to the shadows until today that we actually are beginning to recognize the contributions of Albert, Alfred Wallace who actually independently came up with the same idea as the origin of the species. So I'm going to end, and this is a book review, so I'm going to read this with you. This is the conclusion of Darwin's book. So you don't have to read the entire 14 chapters of the book. By the way, there, are, there were six editions of The Origin of the Species. Simply because of, at that time, Darwin was bombarded with controversies. And so it took him five more editions from the original until he closed the book. And so I'm going to end and read this with you. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, which is its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator, suggesting to us that Yes, he believed in his theory of evolution, but he was still a creationist. Into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. This is Darwin's most important contribution to our lives as modern scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turnigan. But humans are not about science, philosophy, and religion only. There is art. Which books to choose from the literary canon? Somehow this, to many, may be an easy choice. 
No doubt Don Quixote, the Arabian Nights, or the children's stories from Perot or Anderson have high literary impact, but none really comes close to the breadth, power, and impact of our ninth book, the works of William Shakespeare and his first folio. Of all the authors in all languages, only Shakespeare seems to be a truly universal genius whose works are translated in every language and where generation after generation, artists go back to his plays for inspiration and to create their own versions of his insights. A Japanese Macbeth, a Russian Hamlet, an Egyptian Lear, they are all possible and contemporary. Even Hollywood goes back to his plays again and again. Dr. Chris Frangillo will speak to us about the impact of Shakespeare on the world of literature and languages. Dr. Frangillo has taught at Florida Tech since 2001. His master's thesis topic was King John, and his PhD dissertation subject was Shakespeare's close contemporary, Christopher Marlowe. He is a lifetime member of the Shakespeare Association of America and writes a blog called Shakespeare's Dog. Please welcome Dr. Frangillo. <clears throat> that wasn't five minutes. <laughs> so um, it's really great to be here, and I'm very happy to speak about Shakespeare and his influence. Um, I should say, as you know, Shakespeare was a playwright. And so he wrote scripts for plays that were meant to be performed. So just to read the text as literature is one way to appreciate him, but obviously to, to see his plays performed is, is another. So uh, I would just like to say maybe three or four things about Shakespeare's influence. The, the first one has to do with linguistics. Uh, in one way, Shakespeare's words are like the air we breathe. They are everywhere, but hardly noticed. Many of the common expressions now thought to be cliches were Shakespeare's creations. Chances are, you use Shakespeare's expressions all the time, even though you may not know it. If you cannot understand my argument and declare it's Greek to me, you're quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> if you claim to be more sinned against than sinning, if you recall your salad days, if you act more in sorrow than in anger, if your wish is father to the thought, if your lost property has vanished into thin air, if you have ever refused to budge an inch or suffered from green-eyed jealousy, if you have played fast and loose, if you have been tongue-tied, a tower of strength, hoodwinked, or in a pickle, you are quoting Shakespeare. So right now, if you want to bid me good riddance and send me packing, <laughs> if you wish I were dead as a doornail, if you think I'm an eyesore, a laughingstock, the devil incarnate, a stony-hearted villain, bloody-minded, or a blinking idiot, then by Jove, O oh Lord, tut tut, for goodness sake, what the dickens. But me no but, it's all one to me, for you are quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> and we could go on and on, but since brevity is the soul of wit, I'll know. <laughs> so linguistically, Shakespeare's helped create our language, but as we heard, you know, just a moment ago, Hollywood, all forms of popular media, you know, really take Shakespeare, they steal from Shakespeare in the same way that Shakespeare stole from others. In addition to several thousand words and phrases, there seems to be an endless list of works in literature and art directly and indirectly inspired by the bard. In this way, his influence is multiplied exponentially through the works and the study of these other great writers. Shakespeare's quotations have influenced the choices of hundreds of titles of novels and films. Just a tiny sampling would include novel titles like the following. I'm sure you can have your, you have your own list. The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, Macbeth, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, The Tempest, The Winner of Our Discontent by John Steinbeck, Richard III, Something Wicked This Way Comes by Rad Ray Bradbury, The Undiscovered Country, The Dogs of War, Bell, Book, and Candle. So all these are very highly regarded novels that were inspired from language of Shakespeare's plays. One measure of Shakespeare's greatness is what other great writers think about him, with the idea being that imitation is a sincere form of flattery. 
not just elite novels, but popular cinema and television, rock and rap music, have carjacked Shakespeare's narratives and characters, often without giving him credit. Like them, Shakespeare also shoplifted his plots and adapted them to the stage. It is often joked that Shakespeare is the busiest writer in Hollywood. This is a testament to how powerful a force his works are in popular and academic culture. Here are just a few older and newer movie titles and plays that make um, that use Shakespeare as a loose uh, adaptation. The great science fiction play Forbidden Planet is taken from The Tempest, Throne of Blood from Macbeth, West Side Story from Romeo and Juliet, Ran from King Lear, My Own Private Idaho, First Henry IV, Kiss Me Kate, Ten Things I Hate About You, The Taming of the Shrew, Oh, Othello, The Lion King, Hamlet, Fox Channel's Empire, King Lear. The list goes on and on like the Atlantic waves making to the Melbourne shore. The third way I think that Shakespeare is important is the way he illuminates human experience uh, in the way no one else does. Shakespeare's linguistic brilliance and his mastery of narrative are rivaled only by his characterization. His earthy, lusty, vibrant depictions of characters, people like Ophelia, Bottom, Cleopatra, Hamlet, Falstaff, Iago, Lear, are unparalleled. These characters seem to walk the streets of our modern world, still strutting and fretting their hour upon the stage. They can be politically analyzed, gossiped over, judged transgressive, psychoanalyzed, and critiqued as if they were not fictive constructs, but real-life contestants dancing on a game show. Who hasn't acted the fool, dated a Romeo, or played the Romeo? Who hasn't hamleted a decision or been stabbed in the back by an office Iago or seduced by a Cleopatra? The DNA of Shakespeare's characters is reproduced throughout our culture in ways that we are only barely conscious. He haunts our pre-memory. He has infected us collectively with hardly any notice. You don't have to read about King Lear's hubris, Lady Macbeth's political ambition, or Othello's sexual jealousy to understand Lance Armstrong, Hillary Clinton, or O.J. Simpson. <clears throat> but it can't hurt. <laughs> His stories form our secular Bible. Sorry, Father Doug. <laughs> His stories form our secular Bible. His characters are its unholy saints. And he, the playwright, is our distant, icy, Olympian god, bestowing uh, on us his divine words, but refusing to reveal himself, even to those monkish English professors who search him out. His plots and characters are such stuff as modern dreams and nightmares are made of. To crawl inside the skull of Hamlet in one of his several soliloquies is to experience reality as Homer or Dante could not imagine. It is to be or not to be truly human, that is, a fully modern human, conflicted, literate, anxious, spied upon, hesitant, doomed. So the last part. <clears throat> ben Johnson says Shakespeare is not for an age, but for all time. But will this always be the case? Will Will's influence be as robust in 10 years or 50 or 100? The jury is out on that question. But Shakespeare's next century is likely to be less friendly to him than the last, and the century after that still friendly less. This is partly because his words receive every recede every year like objects in the rear view mirror as we race to tweets, 140 characters, Snapchats, texting, and emo joys. Looking back, the past four centuries have been good to Shakespeare. School children can no more avoid his plays than a trip to the dentist or eating their vegetables. <laughs> all of which are supposed to be good for you, although stressful in different ways. Shakespeare's playhouses have been reconstructed from Alabama to Oregon and all around the globe, making it easy as pie to see his dramas performed. In his 55th sonnet, Shakespeare suggested that his writings would endure when other things wouldn't. 
his powerful rhyme would be eternal. But he also realizes in this poem that everything changes. Things like marble, like gilded monuments of princes and statues will all go away, ruined by history's indifferent and calloused hand. Everything decays slowly like radioactivity, and the only living record of writing would have the chance to outrun time. As the Renaissance led to enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution to the Electronic Age, digital media has rearranged our lives, if not brain synapses, in ways that Shakespeare could not have imagined. What he did imagine was time changing everything, something that has finally come true for his writing. As our language and literacy crumble, older forms of English become more obsolete, and the passion for those unique, antique words grows colder as the glowing screens of our computers and innumerable apps proclaim the dominance of the image over the word. It is optimistic to think that he will remain eternally current. His high tide has already passed. It lasted, scholars tell us, for just a century between 1870 and 1970. Since that time, his works have declined in relative popularity, not annihilated by the hand of time, but subjected to it. People know his reputation, not his words. He is taught as film, not literature. Shakespeare will be with us tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, of course. But eventually, alas, he will be what Geoffrey Chaucer, Edmund Spencer, and John Milton have become, a brilliant author whose works can be read intelligently in the original by few people. There's already a translation of Shakespeare into modern English in the works. What happens to his iambic pentameter, his rhyme, his rhetorical figures, his songs, his sound, his subtle poetic art? One can only guess and shudder. There is no translating Shakespeare. This is highly regrettable and somewhat tragic <clears throat> because we need him. Shakespeare seems like the one thing that we shouldn't have to sacrifice in order to have our electronic gadgetry. Like a computer scientist, he wrote the most elegant, eloquent version of code, a semiotic code we call the human being. In his examination of the struggle between illusion and truth, he probes the fabric of reality as much as Newton or Galileo. Experiencing or reading his plays <clears throat> is to hold a mighty instrument in one's hands. It is to peer through the Hubble telescope or an electronic microscope and behold the elemental nature of humanity. Shakespeare is the most anti-digital of authors. His complexity and richness asks for exceptional, exceptional literacy, concentration, and quiet. Things found, thankfully, in our Evans Library, <laughs> but not typically associated with our present technological age. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frendel. Well, that's nine books, just one more. And the last document is truly universal in its appeal and has changed our perceptions of ourselves and of our relationships to other human beings. It is the most powerful idea sweeping the world today and gives us a lens through which we see and analyze our actions and those of others elsewhere in the world. We are better, loftier people because of it. What, could, what more could we ask for from our final choice? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations in 1948 and subsequently has been enshrined in various international treaties and covenants. Dr. Anthony Catanese, President of Florida Institute of Technology, will speak to us about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Dr. Catanese has been President of Florida Tech since 2002. 
He has held academic positions at institutions such as Pratt Institute in New York City, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and Georgia Tech, and was previously president of Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Katniss was also a senior Fulbright professor at the Pontificia Universidad Javiana in Bogota, Colombia. <laughs> I've been working on that all day. <laughs> Additionally, he was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to the National Urban Policy Task Force. Please welcome Dr. Katniss. So, it's been a long evening, and I am the 10th and final speaker, and I've been asked to give you a book report on something that's not a book. <laughs> it's a committee report. But hear me out. I think you'll, uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, many times our international students ask me, what, what's so exceptional about the United States? Uh, why is it such a great country? And I say it's our basic beliefs and our core values, uh, best found in the Declaration of Independence, 1776, and 15, 20 years later, the Constitution of the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness further elaborated in our Constitution with the Bill of Rights. And many of you know those, those rights, of course. Maybe the most important, the freedom of speech. Uh, if it wasn't for the First Amendment, we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of worship, freedom of religion, uh, freedom to petition, and indeed, the right to bear arms. Uh, these are ideas that came to America from other parts of the world, mostly Western parts, but also the Muslim world. But they found their cathexis, their, their concentration uh, in America, uh, in the New World. So forward to the late 1940s, uh, the end of World War II, uh, we were just beginning to understand the horrors of global warfare. Uh, we didn't even know how many people were killed. Uh, the estimates range from 20 to 30 million people. With 10 million people, it was unclear whether they were alive or not. And of course, we believe that 6 million Jews were killed because they were Jews. A terrible period in human history. We're just beginning to understand it at that point, and the nascent uh, United Nations uh, the successor to the League of Nations was beginning to deal with these questions. Now, there was a precursor, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, during World War II, led the belief that why are we in this war? We're in this war to protect what Roosevelt called the four basic freedoms of humanity. The freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom from fear, and the freedom from want. So the United Nations, through its committees, uh, came up with, these document, with this document. It was, in fact, uh, 30 reports. And by the way, if you haven't read it, it's right there on the wall, uh, up to the second, uh, stair uh, second floor. Uh, and that's, of course, just the condensed version. As I say, there are 30 reports, 30 covenants that make up the uh, declaration. So, so what did it say? Uh, it said that all human beings, on this earth, all men and women had certain inalienable human rights. Those rights included the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, the freedom of religion and worship, the freedom of assembly, the right to petition, the right to be secure in their homes, the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure, and free from arbitrary arrest and punishment. Sound familiar? something that had been inculcated in American uh, basic beliefs for all these years. So after much debate, the United Nations passed, uh, put this declaration up for vote. Now you would think, well, that's not going to be very controversial. It was. It was amazingly controversial. 
many countries did not want this declaration passed. Interestingly, there was great debate in the Muslim countries. Uh, some Muslim countries said this is a violation of Sharia law, but other Muslim countries says, oh no, this is what the Quran says. You can't argue with the Quran, and those countries prevailed. Not too surprisingly, the communist countries were very much opposed, led by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, they fought against this declaration. Countries like Poland, Hungary, Romania, at the time, opposed this declaration, but it did pass. Now, it wasn't law. It was a declaration of human rights, of universal human rights, but over time, it has found its way into many international treaties, many state laws, many state constitutions, even places like Colombia, where I was a professor. It is in their constitution. So indeed, it has a tremendous force in shaping the world. Now, has it been completely successful? Has this declaration reshaped the world? No, I don't think so. Uh, not yet. But I think we can truly say the Declaration of Universal Human Rights has become an ideal, a goal for all humanity, and it is shaping the world that we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katniss. So that was the list of the 10 books that most shaped the world. You can see them on this slide as well. Certainly others would choose different books. Perhaps the real value of such an exercise is that you think about and reevaluate important books. You embark on an intellectual journey of your own making. Whether you think of it as revisiting many old and wonderful friends, admiring the skill of many players as you try to assemble an all-star team, or exploring jewels you may have missed, the effort is worthwhile. <laughs>